Well, good evening, everyone, and I am glad to be here tonight. <clears throat> I'm sorry that uh, I can't see you in person and that we can have our usual Sabbath service, but, you know, the Lord always takes care of us and he always provides for us. Um, I'm missing my PowerPoint, so um, that'll... I'm going to have to do some reading then from the script, but basically I'm here to talk to you about forgiveness and the relationship of trauma and the ability of people to forgive. Now I have many different sections on forgiveness and trauma and hopefully in the next couple weeks <clears throat> we will be doing some other seminars but there's one or two things I just want to mention to begin with. One is this book. It's called I Forgive You, But. If you want to get a good book, a good Christian book on forgiveness, talking about trauma, this is by Lourdes E. Morales Gundaman's son. And she has written a number of books. Um, you probably recognize the name. She does seminars, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. And this is the best book that I can find. It's easy to read and to understand. <clears throat> and she developed this book because of some things in her life. And so it really starts out helping you to feel comfortable with all of the things that she's going to be talking about. <clears throat> so tonight, we're just going to talk about what forgiveness is and some of the scriptures that are related to that. While forgiveness can undoubtedly bring physical healing, the leads to another question, what exactly is forgiveness? And this is by Anne C. Rinson, Joan Stealth Warner, and Louis Rinson, and this is their definition. <clears throat> A consensual definition may be emerging with the following three elements. Forgiveness is a process that takes time. I don't know if you heard the name of my seminar or what, but it says a journey to forgiveness. This is not something that just you can do overnight or just happened overnight. And if you've been struggling with that whole image or process that you have to do it, like that, that's not true. This is a journey. It's a journey for all of us. And so a consensual definition is following the three elements. Forgiveness is a process that takes time. It involves the letting go of a negative response following an offense. Through forgiveness, a positive response toward the offender emerges. So as you travel this journey and go through this process, there will be many stages and many difficult time periods. And then there'll be others that are filled with joy and drawing closer and closer to the Lord. It says, often people who have been traumatized feel that if they forgive those who have injured them, they will somehow release the individual from the consequences of their action. If they are not moved forward, it is helpful to share with them errors of this way of thinking. Just because you forgive someone, and you will hear more about this as we go on, that doesn't necessarily mean they do not have consequences that they must deal with. The following is what biblical forgiveness is not. Biblical forgiveness is not the absence of anger. The Bible includes many passages where the emotion of anger is acknowledged and expressed. <clears throat> if you want to look at a good psalm focusing on that, it's Psalm 109. It describes not only the anger of the psalmist, but also the depressive-like symptoms that accomplish or accompany such anger. And we know that people who have had some trauma in their lives, and really probably all of us on some level at some time have had some trauma in their lives. 
And usually there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger, oftentimes depression, and the person holds on to these things or puts them aside for a while and then all of a sudden there's a trigger and, and, and it comes back. And what we want for all of us, what I want it for myself, is that to be able to not have any of those things going on in my life, to be able to forgive and then give and then give it to the Lord. Biblical forgiveness is not the absence of consequences, as we said. This is a major concern to those who have been injured or traumatized. Thou answerest them, this is a verse from Psalms 99.8, Thou answerest them, O Lord our God, Thou was a God that forgave them, though thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. If biblical forgiveness is not the absence of anger or consequences, then what is it? And I think this is very important because I think a lot of times we really don't understand the whole process of forgiveness and what is involved and what you need to do or what you need to not do, and it is a journey, it is a process. Biblical forgiveness is allowing God to be in control of the consequences. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And it's good when you're going through this process to find some scriptures that really touch the aspect that you're going through in your life and to memorize it and to have it there in your head so that when something comes up that reminds you of it or you're starting to feel really down or anxious, that you have Bible verses that you can hold on to. And... <clears throat> The Lord is who we need to give these problems to. The Lord is who we need to give these pro actions or feelings <clears throat> or incidents to and let him take care of it. I know that's very hard to do. I think it's hard for us to do in any aspect of our lives um, is to let things go and give it to the Lord. But the closer we draw to him, the closer we study and look at his scriptures, the easier it is. And he will bring peace to your life like you have never felt before. And I have had that kind of experience a number of times. And it's just such a beautiful experience. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to take over control of whatever is going on and happening and tell him, I'm done with it, I'm giving it to you, and don't take it back. Because <laughs> we have a tendency to want to take it back. But as you do that, as you strengthen your faith in God and the Holy Spirit, you will see miracles happening in your life. I've not only seen them in my life, but in other people. And oftentimes it does take time. It may take a year. It may take more than that, depending upon the offense and what has happened and going on. A couple years ago, my husband and I were asked to go to the Navajo Reservation up in Chinle in North Arizona. Pastor and his wife had taken over a little church there, and they were really struggling with the people because they have so much pain and so much hurt. There was one lady who had lost 15 members of her family and I think over a period of two years. They see a lot of addictions there, a lot of alcohol and drugs. Every year there are people that freeze because they are using the alcohol and drugs. And he said, I just don't know what to do with them. So we put a seminar together, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we went up there, and um, we did it. And we were able to initially each tell about our miracles and what the Lord did for us. 
and the traumas that we had had in our life. That's how we started out, and by the time we finished, everybody in the pews was crying. And everybody wanted to tell their story. Because when you can tell your story, and then you can see people and the Lord coming to you, to strengthen you, you can start to let it go. We had the most fabulous weekend there. And it was just overwhelming how these people changed. The pastor kept saying, I can't believe this is happening in a weekend. And they were just so glad and so happy and hugging us because this was the first time they had really been able to talk to somebody about that and to let it go. So it, it's there for us, giving it to the Holy Spirit and letting God take charge of that issue and that problem. Biblical forgiveness is avoiding our natural negative response and deliberately choosing a positive response. And this is part of self-talk and the brain and how that works. And I hope that the next time, um, if we meet together like this or in some other circumstances, that I can teach you how to change the negative thoughts in your brain. Because once they get in there, they stay there. But there's a way to change it. There's a way to move them to become positive. And again, from experience, I can tell you that works. I taught psychiatric mental health nursing for 28 years. And I did a class on changing your thoughts. And it was amazing the number of students over the years that came to me and said, can you really do that? Can that really happen? And I taught them the process of what they had to do. And most of them came back, not all of them, um, told me it was very hard and they didn't know how they were going to be able to do this. But with support, they worked through it. It took them, it took them a long time, some of them. It took a young girl a couple years. And it depends upon what's happening, what's going on, how you're feeling about it. But I can help you change those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. It's hard. It takes a lot of work. You have to stick with it, but you can do that. And I hope that maybe at some point in time before I leave, um, I'm from Arizona, I'll be here for another six weeks or so, that we can get together again and I can teach you how to do that. Bible forgiveness is avoiding our natural negative responses. See, this is the scripture from 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Biblical forgiveness calls for blessings and praying for those who have injured us. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Luke 6, 28. I'm sure that that's one you're familiar with. Biblical forgiveness calls us not to gloat, but rather to grieve when those against us stumble and fall. Rejoice not when thy enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbles. Biblical forgiveness leads us to love and pray for those who have traumatized us. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute, persecute you. That's from Matthew 5.44. That's one of those verses that's very, very hard to read. We don't hear a lot of sermons and things like that on, on some of these types of verses because, first of all, nobody, you know, nobody wants to say it, and a lot of people, they just don't want to hear it. They want to 
have someone take care of all of it. Biblical forgiveness calls upon believers to seek to live at peace with those who have wronged them. If it be possible, as much as in you, live peaceably with all men. And that's from Romans 12, 18. I'm giving you some scriptures here with this because I want you to realize that this is not coming from me. I have not made it up. This is coming from the Lord. Biblical forgiveness motivates us to come to the assistance of our enemies when they experience practical difficulties. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him. Biblical forgiveness is following God's example of forgiveness. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. When, when, we, think, when we think about this one, you need to think about where are you spending eternity? Are you on your road to heaven and living with Jesus? Um, what are the things that... Don't let someone, don't let anyone take away your relationship with the Lord. Don't let anyone take away the constant love and care that he has for you. Don't let anyone mess up what we're looking forward to, and that's the coming of Jesus Christ and spending eternity with him. You have to see that as your goal so that no one else can pull you away or turn you away, or turn you away from him. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about what things you can do or what things they have found helpful in therapy in that um, when someone is really struggling with trauma. How can people be assisted in a practical manner in moving forward on the path toward forgiveness? Focus on their physical condition in needly depression and anxiety recovery program. This goal is accomplished through the physician-directed exercise, massage, hydrotherapy, proper nutrition, and a high volume of water intake. All of those things that Sister White has given us to, told, to tell us that these are things that we need to do to take care of our bodies. These modalities assist in, in, in improving circulation in all parts of the body, including the most important, the frontal lobe of the brain. We know that the frontal lobe is right here. It's sometimes referred to as the CEO of the brain because this is where decisions are made in this part of the brain. So when things are... Drugs, for example, are taken in, alcohol and drugs. It turns off that C CEO. It, it can't make rational and good decisions and judgments. This is why someone who is drinking in a bar and goes outside with his keys and someone says, let me take your keys, let me take you home, um, you can't drive. And he says, I can drive. I don't have any problems driving. I'm not drunk. That's because that alcohol has diminished the working of the CEO. And he can no longer make reasonable, rational decisions. This can come, this can come from many things other than alcohol. It can come from how we feel about ourselves and others. It can come from certain other medications. It can come from just a negative attitude. It can come from the anxiety, the depression, those kinds of things which you may be experiencing or have experienced and kind of keep coming back up again. As the frontal lobe is strengthened, 
Educate them in the brain's executive functionings. Executive functions have been defined as a group of cognitive control processes working together to regulate and shape behavior, thoughts, and feelings in a goal-directed manner. Now, if you can just imagine then, if we have depressed the frontal lobe, the CEO, um, I'm sorry, I lost my thoughts here, that this cognitive control process determines behavior, thoughts, feelings in a goal-directed manner. And how can anyone function in a normal way if all of those processes are interrupted? Facilitate the healing process by making them write, make them aware of writing interventions that can enhance their ability to forgive. Research shows that writing to groups of people de dealing with consequences of transgressions, they gave one group counterintuitive assignment to, to write things down while the other group wrote about the traumatic aspects of the recent transgression and they journaled about those things and then they came back and they said these results suggested that writing exercises focused on benefit finding may be unique <coughs> and useful addition to efforts to help people forgive interpersonal transgressions through structured interventions. This is another thing we did when we were in the Indian Reservation, at the end, we asked them to write down on a piece of paper. And we told them we were going to take these and we were going to pin them to the cross and then we were going to have some seasons of prayer. And it was, it was interesting. Usually we give pieces of paper about this size and people write two or three sentences down and that's it. These people wrote pages and pages and pages of things that were in their life that they wanted to turn over and give to the Lord. And we did that, and at the end of that, we had some seasons of prayer, and then we took all of those off the cross, and we burned them. In other words, we gave them to the Lord. They're done with. We don't deal with them anymore. And the pastor and his wife told us afterward that um, they had a very, you know, a very positive response to that. I want to share a story with you. I think probably we're getting close to closing. And you can share stories from Scripture. If, if we were in a group where we were talking, I would ask you to share some stories for scripture, from Scripture and history that shows the power of forgiveness. Holocaust survivor Corey Ten Boom, which you probably have heard of, Boom's description of a challenging act of forgiveness is especially apt in demonstrating this, as it pulls together many concepts that we have mentioned. Facing the German guard responsible for the death of hundreds, including her sister in a brutal concentration camp, Ten Boom recalls, and, I st and still I stood there, with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and then the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus prayed, I prayed silently. I can't lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current state of my soldier, the current startled my shoulder and ran down my arm, sprang out of our, my joints, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood through my whole being, 
bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all of my heart. It appears that Ten Boom's ruminations over the past trauma was disallowing her to express forgiveness until she, through prayer and the frontal lobe function, was able to choose to move forward with the, with the decision, an act, an act of executive functioning, that frontal brain, to forgive from her heart the one who had so traumatized her. It is by the contemplation of such stories that the forgiving spirit of Christ, which has motivated such forgiveness, begins to be more fully appreciated. When people like Ten Boom, who experience significant trauma, recognize that Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. As they realize that, he was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. And as they grasp the reality, he suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. They see the healing power of God's forgiveness beginning to heal through a contemplation of his healing love as they consider that the wounds he experienced and the death he died was for them, their hearts are healed and they are empowered as Ten Boom was to extend, to extend the healing love to others. Finally, in light of Christ constraining love, pray the following prayer. And I'm gonna hesitate here and I hope that at home or wherever you are, that you will pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your love for me and your forgiveness of me. I choose to have the same spirit and to forgive. Continue to fill me with your spirit so I can be like you. Forgiveness plays a pivotal role in the recovery of physical, mental, spirit, and spiritual health. As pastors and leaders in association with church members, we need to lead people through these steps. We need to make decisions that we want to go through those steps, that we want to turn our lives over to the Lord. And as I said before, in the times that I've done that in my life, that has brought such joy and healing and disbelief that I was able to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I have a problem or thinking badly or having issues in my life, the first thing I do is I go to the mirror and I say, look, Lord, I, Holy Spirit, I'm having a problem with this. I don't know what to do. I can't handle it by myself. So please, I'm, I'm turning this over to you. And I say what it is. I'm giving it to you. And I am not going to live with this anymore. And sometimes it's taking three months. Sometimes it's taken six months. But the Lord has taken care of all of those things. And it has increased my faith 100% or more than 100%, 1,000%. So that I know when I'm in that kind of a situation that I have a connection. And I can go to that connection and I will receive help and love and peace. Thank you.